Monoclonal antibodies are extremely useful tools for treating diseases and disorders in humans, also used as tools in biomedical research. So let's learn about how monoclonal antibodies are made, and we'll also talk about treatments that are monoclonal antibodies used to treat diseases like cancer, autoimmune disorders, uh, transplantation, rejection, etc. So, um, Monoclonal antibodies uh, first start with uh, a target. Let's say a scientist or a clinician wants to generate an antibody that binds some protein. We're going to call it protein X. So protein X is very important in some disease or disorder, or a scientist wants to study protein X. So what does the scientist do to generate an antibody that binds protein X? That would be a useful tool for medicine and for research. So here's the protein, protein X, and you can see it's got two alpha helices, it's got a beta sheet. So what can be done is the protein can be injected into an animal, such as a mouse or a rat or a um, rabbit. Those are three common animals that are used to generate antibodies. So you inject the protein into an animal, but of course that's not, it's, the protein's not necessarily immunogenic. It's not a pathogen, so to get an immune response, you have to um, usually include an adjuvant, something that's going to stimulate an immune response. So injecting a protein plus an adjuvant into these animals will hopefully generate uh, an immune response. And so what do we mean by an immune response here? Well, we want B cells with their B cell receptor to come and see if they bind this molecule. So the naive B cells in this animal uh, are going to come and check their antigen binding sites on their B cell receptors to see if they have a uh, antigen binding site that binds some epitope on the surface of this antigen. All right, we're going to call protein X the antigen. So these two B cells on the left there, they don't bind, so they're going to ignore this uh, protein. But this B cell here, let's say it's undergone VDJ recombination, junctional diversity, combination of heavy and light chain, so that its variable region come together in an antigen binding site that binds that alpha helix. So you, the B cell receptor cross-linking occurs, that B cell activates, and it's going to differentiate into a plasma cell and start secreting antibodies that bind specifically that alpha helix, so that epitope of the antigen. Maybe another B cell, it has a different B cell receptor because of different VDJ recombination, junctional diversity, so it now binds uh, the beta sheet epitope on the surface of this uh, protein. Um, and maybe a third B cell, it has an uh, antigen binding site that binds another, a different alpha helix. Right? So the amino acids in that alpha helix are different than the amino acid in the first alpha helix. So this antibody binds this epitope. So B cells 1, 2, and 3 all uh, activate and secrete antibody that bind this protein. B cells 4, B cells 5, they don't. Maybe they recognize something else. They make antibodies against something else. So this is the first step in, in generating monoclonal antibodies. Right? You do this in the animal. Well, what do you do next? These cells are not useful if they're still in an animal. So the scientists will extract plasma cells from the animal, grow them in the lab. Now, uh, what are you going to do with them in the lab? They're just plasma cells. They might not live forever. And we don't know. There are tons of plasma cells that you isolate. Which ones are the useful ones? So we've got to solve these two problems, that these plasma cells are not going to be useful unless we can grow them indefinitely in the lab and then figure out which antibodies are useful from which B cells. So the first thing that occurs is that the B cells are fused with a type of cancer cell known as a myeloma cell. So fusing the B cell with the myeloma cell will produce something called a hybridoma cell. And what this does is it gives the B cell immortality. These cells can be grown indefinitely in the lab. Like many cancer cells, the cancer cells extracted from uh, patients can be grown indefinitely in the lab forever. And so uh, this fusion between a plasma cell and a myeloma cell produces a hybridoma cell that still has the properties of a plasma cell. It will still make and secrete antibodies, but now these cells will grow indefinitely in the laboratory. So that's the first step. We've uh, made them immortal. The second step is to isolate them from each other and see which antibodies they make. So you have to isolate each individual plasma cell, 
um, grow them separate from one another and extract the antibodies from each of them. And the, we wanted to generate an antibody that binds protein X. So you test all the antibodies and see which one of them bind protein X. And so we saw on the last slide, B cells one, two, and three, they all bound protein X. They all had antigen binding sites that binds protein X. B cells four, B cells five, their antibodies, they bind something else, they don't bind protein X. So what we've done here is we have established three monoclonal antibodies that bind protein X. So each of these antibodies might have uh, a different epitope that they bind. We saw that in the first video. B cell one binds an alpha helix, B cell two binds a beta sheet, B cell three binds a different alpha helix. And so these might be useful in different instances in treatments or in the laboratory. Um, so B cell, so monoclonal antibodies might have different epitopes that they bind, and they might also have different affinities for their epitopes. So we might have want a really strong affinity, really high affinity, and maybe B cell 2 with its antigen binding site has the highest affinity. So we might work with B cell 2, uh, the antibodies that come out of B cell 2 um, for the research that we're performing or for the disease that we're treating. So scientists don't know that until they um, generate these monoclonal antibodies and then either test them in the lab or test them in animal models. But now we've generated monoclonal antibodies. So when you generate monoclonal antibodies, um, uh, what, do you, what do we do with them? Well, let's talk a little bit about nomenclature before we start using them. So again, the way monoclonal antibodies are work uh, or are generated is you take this protein you're interested in studying or targeting, you inject it into an animal such as a rabbit or a mouse, and you perform what we saw on the last slide. So if, uh, in terms of nomenclature, this antibody that binds protein X that comes out of a mouse and that you went through all these steps to generate clones, individual clones of B cells and screen them, you would call this a monoclonal mouse anti-X antibody. So that's the nomenclature we use when we talk about antibodies. Monoclonal, one clone of B cells, comes from a mouse, binds protein X. So you'd say it's an anti-X antibody. And so I give you this information because if you're a scientist working in the lab, you will see this type of nomenclature. Or even in some um, uh, drugs that are antibodies, it'll have this type of nomenclature. Uh, I will tell you that um, there are other types of antibody preparations known as polyclonal antibodies. So polyclonal antibodies, which are commonly generated in Rabbits could also be generated in mice. Generated the via the same way. You inject protein X into an animal, such as a rabbit, and with an adjuvant, and you isolate plasma cells, and you fuse them with myeloma cells to make hybridoma cells. But you um, don't bother screening individual B cells. You throw all the B cells together, and you just harvest all the antibodies out of the B cells. So the antibodies come from many clones of B cells. So they are polyclonal. Because you know what? You don't really care which antibodies bind and which antibodies don't. As long as a good percentage of the antibodies bind, you can use this. These are used usually in the laboratory for research for things like Western blotting or immunofluorescence. So there are some polyclonal antibodies generated in the lab uh, this way. Um, they come from many B cells because you don't care about individual, uh, you don't care for getting 100% of antibodies binding, just the majority is fine enough. So now uh, let's talk about uses of antibodies. Mono and typically, if you're going to treat disease, you want monoclonal antibodies. Polyclonals used in the lab for research. Monoclonals used in humans for treating diseases. So can you take an antibody from a mouse and inject it into a human. You could, uh, and that's been done before, but there's a problem that comes up. So here's a mouse antibody. It's got mouse heavy chain and mouse light chain, and it binds protein X, but it's a mouse protein. So a mouse protein is going to be uh, a problem because mouse proteins are not human proteins. Mouse proteins will be identified as foreign or non-self in the human body. So humans will make probably a naive B cell that binds the FC region a lot, typically, or it could be other parts of the constant region of the mouse antibody. 
right? This is not a good thing because this means that the human B cell will make antibodies that will attack and uh, form immune complexes with the mouse antibody. And that's not a good thing. That's going to provoke a uh, type 3 hypersensitivity reaction. So injecting mouse antibodies into a human is actually going to provoke a not good immune response. So uh, how do we get around that? Well, scientists have figured out we can replace some of the mouse constant regions with human constant regions. So we have humanized the mouse antibody. So again, if you want to target protein X in a uh, disease or disorder, um, sure, inject protein X into a mouse, make monoclonal antibodies, and then genetically engineer the cells so that the constant region of the antibody is human, and only the variable region of the antibody is mouse. Much So most of this antibody complex is from human protein, not mouse protein. So we call this a humanized antibody or a chimeric antibody, where the majority of the sequence is human sequence, and humans should not make antibodies against human sequences. So you'll find a number of drugs uh, that are antibodies are humanized antibodies or chimeric antibodies. So the variable region might come from a mouse or a rabbit or a rat, but the constant region comes from humans. Um, but even better than that, uh, and uh, something that's a little more recent, is to generate a fully human antibody from a mouse. How can you generate human antibodies from a mouse? So there are genetically uh, engineered mice um, where the mouse heavy chain gene and light chain gene have been inactivated and they've been replaced with the human heavy chain gene and light chain gene. So it's a normal mouse except for its immunoglobulin genes. So when you inject protein X and adjuvant into this mouse, its B cells have B cell receptors that are made from the human heavy chain gene and the human light chain gene. So when it makes plasma cells that secrete antibodies, they are mouse cells secreting human antibodies. And these are fully human antibodies. So you can isolate them, purify them, and inject them into humans, and they will not provoke a immune response. Um, so fully human antibodies can be isolated from mice. You could isolate human antibodies from humans, but it's not very ethical to inject proteins into humans to try to get them to generate antibodies. So that ends this video of talking about the creation of monoclonal antibodies. The next video will give you examples of monoclonal antibodies used to treat diseases and disorders.